as many people on the panel have been calling it in informal discussion, the Brexit session there. Um, but there's much more than Brexit to discuss there. And I'm delighted to be joined by three distinguished Europeanists there who will talk about um, the, the real key issues facing this part, this region of the globe, um, over the next hour. Kurt Dekeler, the Secretary General of the League of European Research Universities, uh, Professor Michael Arthur, President of University College London, and commentator in the Times uh, as of today on issues to do with universities of Brexit, and Frédéric Mion, President of Sciences Po. There. Um, but, but to begin with, I've been very struck over the past um, day and a half there how many colleagues, of course, are seeing this not simply as a challenge for British universities and Europe more generally, but as an opportunity for staff recruitment, <laughs> particularly if you're in Asia, Australia, North America, or Latin America there. So to get a sense of the perspective of you here in the audience, could we <coughs> just do a quick straw poll? How many of you wake up in the middle of the night worried about Brexit? Could you put your hands up, please? OK. A small-ish number there. How many of you see the changing world of European higher education as an opportunity for your own institutions? Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> So that gives us the context in which we have this global conversation about how do we maintain research excellence in a changing Europe. Kurt, would you like to begin? Yeah. Perhaps I stand up anyway, mm -hmm. because otherwise those people are not going to see me. So. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Evelyn, and thank you for the invitation to be here and to say a few words about one of my pet topics, Brexit. So, uh, uh, I will disappoint you at the very beginning already, ladies and gentlemen, but in my personal opinion, not in the opinion of Leary, of course, but I speak in my own personal opinion as a lawyer and as a lobbyist in Brussels, Brexit is not going to happen. <laughs> Brexit is not going to happen. Just give it a bit more time, and then we will see that the whole atmosphere, the whole attitude in this country is going to change. We have seen that a number of years ago in Switzerland, we're not in a perfect uh, similar setting, but certainly in a, in, a, in a setting where the same issues were at stake, uh, that people uh, haven't been given the time have changed their mind. And I'm fully convinced that this is also going to happen here, and we see already the first changes for that. So, so the consequence of my starting point is, of course, that this session uh, can already stop now because <laughs> nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to change. International collaboration is going to stay as it is with the UK being an absolute top player in this game. But of course, when I speak with my rectors uh, about this issue, of course, they have to, be prepared, have to be prepared for the worst situation. And that's, of course, uh, something that is their responsibility. They have to make sure that their institution can continue even in these very uncertain times. So even if Brexit is not going to happen, and that brings me to my first very serious point, and Evelyn was already referring to that, the whole atmosphere which is created in this country by a government who doesn't know itself what they want is leading to all kinds of problems in the academic world with regard to exchange of staff, exchange of students, participation in research funding, participation in research infrastructures, free mobility of people, recognition of professional qualifications, and all those things are endangered by this uncertainty which is created by Brexit. And we see, uh, following this from the continent, I see that this uncertain political times lead to a kind of pushing out of people, people going to continental Europe, people going to Australia, and at the same time avoiding that great smart people get in. 
And so obviously, this is a very unfortunate situation. I'm sure that Michael is going to come back to that. If you look at what the government is doing to reassure all of you, uh, the Rutherford Fund, the budget increase, the guarantees for Horizon 2020, I think this is all uh, not enough. Eh? If you see only what is going to be the consequence for the enormous group of ERC grantees that you have in this country, grantees of the European Research Council, people having the most prestigious grants given by the European Commission in the field of research and innovation. Well, obviously, for those people which have to spend every year a half a year in an EU member state or in an associate member state, this is already going to be very problematic. And I'm very glad to see that the academic sector here in this country is now really getting up to speed in the full lobbying, in speaking up uh, loud and clear that things have to change, that the government has to come up with clear decisions, clear policies, and things like that. The question is, of course, how are people thinking about this in Brussels at the European Commission? Uh, I just told uh, some people here when I got into London this morning, I had on the Eurostar three Belgian newspapers, and the first item on Brexit was on page six. I also had The Guardian, and the first five pages of The Guardian were only about Brexit. <laughs> so there is an absolute difference in the way that people are looking to this topic. In continental Europe, this, I'm not going to say that this is detail, but this is certainly not a very important issue for the moment. The European Union is struggling with much bigger problems to keep the Union together, and for the moment they are doing very well, than Brexit. A lot of member states in the European Union are fed up with one member state coming up with all kinds of demands, desiderata, cherry picking, and things like that. While on this side of the channel, you see this enormous fixation, obsession of the country and all kinds of groups with, with Brexit. So, taking into account the time that I have for this first round, it's clear that we have to look for answers in case that, indeed, things would get to the uh, worst case scenario. And certainly in the following months, there will be not a lot of opportunities. Eh? Because, for example, the, the future collaboration in research, innovation, and education between the UK and the EU is not discussed at this point in time. This is only what we call, in a technical way of speaking, phase two of the Brexit negotiations. Eh? If things go well, perhaps the end of this year, early next year. For research, innovation, education, the first priorities are now getting a good settlement for the citizens' rights, for the rights of people coming from continental Europe and living and working here, and vice versa for UK people working in continental Europe so that they are guaranteed of their rights for the future. That doesn't solve the problem for the ERC grantees here in this country, but that's already a first issue. A second issue is, of course, the continued participation of the UK in Horizon 2020. And seemingly on Wednesday this week, a paper is going to be published by the UK government in this series of 12 papers which are coming up on Brexit, in which they say, with seemingly a lot of ampleur, uh, we are going to give 1 billion euro a year uh, for the uh, Horizon 2020 research program. Well, of course, this is not some kind of gesture, nice thing of the UK government. That's something that they are already now, since the beginning of Horizon 2020, legally obliged to do. So, so don't get excited on Wednesday when this paper is presented. This paper probably, and I'm a bit harsh on the UK government for that, uh, this paper probably will be just like the other papers that we have seen over the past week or so, one and a half week or so, or the content will be illegal under EU law, so the European Commission can never sign up to that, or it will be wishful thinking, or it will be a kind of misleading of the public opinion on a number of issues. So, and this is the problem, of course, with which the negotiation teams in Brussels are also confronted. I have a solution, however, if things go wrong. 
And I would call upon all of you, eh, because certainly in continental Europe, there is a huge support for UK universities. All of them, certainly in our group, want to make sure that the collaboration that we have with UK universities can continue as it has been for decades. And so let's all support a specific idea which is in the making and can sound perhaps a little bit technical for those who are coming from outside Europe. But at the end of the day, if a deal is made between the UK and the EU, we must make sure that the UK can be associated to the next framework program. I think that this is an absolute minimum minimum which has to be achieved. Now, association to the research framework program is under the present rules, the rules of Horizon 2020, not possible for the UK if the UK becomes a third country. The rules on association are saying now you can only be associated with the framework program if you are an applying country for membership of the union. And so perhaps the UK can first leave and then reapply. <laughs> Secondly, you are an EFTA country, the European Free Trade Zone and Association. But the UK is not an EFTA country yet. I know that the chairman of the EFTA court is trying to convince all of you in a doubtful legal way, I must say myself, uh, that the UK would become an EFTA country. Because being an EFTA country makes you also submitted to the European Court of Justice, to the European Commission, the EFTA Court, and things like that. All things which are a no-go for the moment. Or you should be part of the European neighborhood policy of the European Union. Like countries like Albania and things like that. So probably that's also not the case yet for the UK. So what we have to do is instead of making sure that the UK gets in one of those three groups of countries, we have to make sure that the criteria for association are modified. And with LERU, with the League of European Research Universities, we are now pushing for FP9, Framework Program 9, the idea that the research program should be open, that means funded, for the best research countries worldwide, so that Canada, Australia can come on board and can benefit from framework program funding. And of course, they will have to pay into the pot, as every country in the European Union is doing. And that for the rest, it is open to other countries to participate. This will solve the problem on the one hand of the reduced international success of Horizon 2020, because the BRIC countries cannot get horizon funding anymore for their researches because they have become too rich. But this opens a perfect avenue for the United Kingdom. If we say the best research countries can associate to the framework program, then this will leave the possibility not only for Canada or for Australia, but also for the UK to make sure that they still can be associated to the framework program and then we will have to make sure that uh, a kind of uh, protest or red line on the ECG, on the European Commission, are given up in time. Of course, I have already taken too much time now. I will leave it here, Evelyn, but I certainly can come back later on. Can we have a round of applause for a solution? <laughs> Michael. Uh, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to come speak. Um, the first thing I want to tell you, just for a little bit of controversy uh, with Kurt, is that um, I chair the EU group for the Russell Group. Please note we don't call it the Brexit group. We call it the <laughs> EU group. It sends a positive signal. And we met with a senior government official uh, from DEX EU last Friday. And the first thing he said was the complete opposite of you, Kurt. He of course, said, of course. Brexit is going to happen, there is no doubt. Um, now, I completely agree with you, I, and I prefer it not to happen. But that is the attitude that one comes across uh, with our government and its officials. About 10 days ago, I had the pleasure of visiting Harwell, and I saw British science at its absolute best. And if you've never been there, to see the diamond synchrotron or the neutron source and to see the level of experimentation and innovation, uh, then I would recommend that you go. 
Uh, and the point I want to make is that, is that British science is amongst the best in the world, possibly and arguably uh, second only to the United States of America. And of course, that has grown up over many decades, and it has grown up uh, in a period where we uh, have been interacting with uh, Europe via the European Union in a very open and constructive uh, manner. If I look at my uh, own institution, I find Europeans overrepresented amongst the many uh, excellent staff uh, that, uh, that I have. Uh, and the point I want to make is that most of them came to the United Kingdom either as PhD students or as postdocs and have stayed and developed their careers here uh, because it was possible um, and because it was easy under the rules of the European Union and of course they enjoyed interacting with British science uh, in that way. So one of my deepest concerns has been of course that we would lose some of those famous professors to the low swoops that have been happening over UCL by several vice chancellors in the audience. <laughs> and I want you to know that I know who you are <laughs> and I know where you live. <laughs> so, um, so of course uh, that's a risk, it's always a risk. This has been going on for many years, I do the same. Uh, of course I try to recruit the very best from uh, all around Europe and, and, and of course from all around uh, the world. But it, it, uh, it, it's not so much that, it's really the pipeline. It's really the pipeline of talent into that level that concerns me the most. And the very slow uh, and, and uh, eroding way uh, in which that pipeline line of talent might disappear. And, and that, of course, is a theory um, and, and, uh, and a potential concern. And, you know, I will be accused almost uh, undoubtedly of being a scaremonger about this set of issues. But what I want to tell you is that it's actually happening now. So whether our politicians like it or not, Brexit and the discussions about Brexit, and in particular the failure to be clear about the future rights of European citizens, my European staff and students, and their rights to stay in this country and to work, and their families, and their access to healthcare, and their access to social care, etc. A failure to be really clear about that is already having an impact. And my evidence for this is something that I was told uh, by uh, deans in the uh, life sciences and medical faculties, because each year we have a series of uh, excellence fellowships. They're very, very highly sought after. We, we, we usually appoint around about six or seven of these. We usually have well over 100 uh, applicants. Um, and usually, 30% of those applicants would be from European institutions, individuals that want to come to the UK. When we ran that programme this year, we had no uh, applications from individuals from other European institutions and that really shocked me and I felt that we should share that, uh, we should be open about it. I was, I was warned that it would cause some damage to UCL. I don't believe that. I think we have to be very clear that these changes that are going on in our country are already beginning to impact on our ability to recruit uh, and retain uh, the very best. I could rattle on uh, forever about research and research funding and all of those areas. I hope we will cover, we will cover those uh, in, um, in discussion. I, I would like to see our government come up with a series of negotiations that maintains full access for the United Kingdom to everything that's good about European research and very importantly, not only Horizon 2020 but Framework 9 and critical in all of that European uh, Research Council. I'm going to stop there. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Michael. Can we say thank you to Michael for actually sharing some quite disturbing news? Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you uh, for having me on this panel. Um, you very kindly referred to us, Evelyn, at the start of this conversation as Europeanists, and uh, I have a, confes a confession and an admission to make. I am not uh, a Europeanist in any sense, and so I'm really bringing to this table the layman's perspective on, on, the, on the whole issue of Brexit as seen from a continental university. And uh, perhaps the first thing I'd like to point out is that Brexit is bad news for all of us. There is no schadenfreude to this. There is no 
in petto thinking that, after all, things are not so bad for us if they're worse for British universities. Uh, I think Brexit really meant bad news for all of us across the continent. Um, and I think we'd all be losing from a temporary or permanent retrenchment of UK scientific forces um, and that we will need to try and find uh, solutions to, uh, to counteract any, um, any movement in that direction. Um, in a sense, our greatest fear when the vote happened was that the closing of UK frontiers would usher in a new phase in British history, which one could dub the, the closing of the British mind um, by referring to the title of uh, <laughs> an important work much debated in the, uh, in the 80s in a very different context, uh, and, um, and uh, that had to do with, uh, with America. Um, and I think that what was heartening in the first few months after the vote was that the reaction of, of British universities to the news was, in fact, proof of the contrary, because uh, we uh, received um, dozens of, uh, of, of testimonies from our UK counterparts um, that they were, in fact, um, extremely disturbed by, by, by the vote and by its consequences. And so, if anything, uh, we were made aware uh, by those universities that they were, if, 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 if at all um, transformed by this, that they were more keen than before to reaffirm the strength of their links with us continental institutions and, and the cooperations already in place, and that they were in fact urging us to try and find new ways to cooperate in the future. So in that sense, I think those first few months were essential in proving to us um, that the gist of uh, British higher education and research was in fact very much um, um, looking for ways to maintain its close ties with, with the rest of uh, the continent. So I would say that at this stage, as far as we're concerned uh, at Sciences Po, a Parisian institution, the only palpable effect of Brexit was precisely that, the renewal of vows, as it were, from a number of our, our, our British counterparts. Of course, more broadly speaking, we're faced with a set of issues um, which were uh, put forward and, and, and already uh, discussed by Kurt and, and Michael. Um, I see three main issues in, in the whole Brexit uh, agenda. First of all, UK access to European funding whether it be Horizon 2020 or the, the framework program number nine. Secondly, uh, all possible barriers to uh, international cooperation. And thirdly, the very pressing issue of the status of EU nationals currently working within uh, uh, British institutions and the status of, of, of EU nationals who might want to come and work in the, in the UK in years to come. As regards the first two issues, those having to do with, with funding and barriers to cooperation, it seems to me that uh, there are a number of precedents which show that solutions can be found, even if Brexit does go through, even if Britain leaves the European Union. We have a set of arrangements with a number of countries that prove that it is possible for those countries, as Court pointed out, with uh, the state of uh, associate uh, participant in, in, in the framework programs, to be part of the game. So you don't need to be an EU member to be part of those schemes. Uh, there are, of course, uh, legalities to be, uh, to be dealt with. There are uh, you know, specific solutions to be found as to eligibility within those frameworks. But at least when there's a will, there's a way. And I'm sure that there will be a, a will and a way um, if, if it comes to that. The third issue, that of um, treatment of EU nationals in the UK, is probably trickier because it isn't limited to UK universities and scientific institutions. It is an issue that has to do more broadly with the way EU nationals will be treated in this country. And so it is probably more likely than the first two issues to be closely dependent upon the progress of overall discussions and negotiations on Brexit in general. And of course, it will be more dependent on the political climate and the, the way British authorities or their European counterparts will want to deal with, with those issue, issues uh, at large. Um, 
I will not go back to, to the ways in which um, it, it, it will be possible in the future for, for, for Britain to remain part of Horizon 2020 or any successor to, to, to this program. I would just like to, to insist upon the fact that UK participation is essential from our point of view. Essential because, as we all know, the UK has done extremely well by those programs. In fact, it's done better than all of us on the continent, receiving a lot more than its share of, in, in terms of contribution. And that's a, a testimony to the talent of, of, the, of the research teams and the institutions in this country. And we need the UK to keep thriving in that context, and possibly even in a wider context in which other countries, which are known to be excellent in research, such as Canada, Australia, or others, would be admitted into the scheme, because that is what fosters healthy competition for us all. It raises standards for us all, and it forces us to be better at the game, and I think that's the only way we can achieve progress, and that's the reason why UK participation, in my view, uh, is an essential, um, uh, an essential part of the future. Um, the real question uh, is how the overall Brexit negotiations will impact that seemingly limited issue, and that goes back to what I was saying before. And in terms of the future of UK universities and, and, uh, and research institutions, it, it seems to me that maybe the, the trickiest question, the one to which I certainly do not have an answer, is whether this whole process, Brexit and, and, and you know, uh, more distance being put between this island or these islands and the continent, whether that will affect in the long run the image of the country in the eyes of the population across the channel. Um, you were saying, Michael, that you, you you had this one experience uh, very recently uh, with regard to your excellent fellowships and, and uh, a total absence of, of uh, candidates from the continent in this round of, of uh, applications this year. That is indeed something that uh, uh, it give, give, gives us matter for, 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 for reflection. If, in the long run, that is the effect that Brexit has, even if the UK remains part of the, of the whole scheme, if it, if Brexit, um, in a sense, um, um, weakens the trust and confidence of the rest of the continent in the UK's commitment to a common future, even with regard to science, and so weakens the ability of the UK to attract talent from all over the continent, um, that is probably what we ought to be most uh, most. Uh, um, preoccupied by and what we need to be aware of for, for the future. That, that's, that needs to be monitored, I would agree, for, for months and years to come. Thank you, Frederick, for that generosity. <laughs> I'd now like to, to turn to you, the audience, as you come from many international perspectives. You don't all have to share your stories of attempting to poach some of Michael's staff, but if you'd like to um, talk about how you see um, these challenges and opportunities and how we can genuinely, as Frederica is suggesting, maintain research excellence within this changing UK climate, but also a climate that's changing across the continent in so many different ways and indeed internationally. They're roving microphones. First question here. Thank you, you very just much. say your name and affiliation, please. My name is Shinyo, and I'm uh, from uh, Japanese University of Kwansei Gakuin. I'm vice president. Well, thank you very much for uh, everybody uh, for your presentation. And um, uh, it seems to me that the Brexit, uh, or perhaps uh, you know the um, um, Trump phenomena, uh, occurred without any deep thinking, without any well-conceived uh, concept. Uh, it's by co coincidence, for example, with regard to the Brexit, because I think Mr. Cameron was uh, very uh, confident that he will be winning. But the, what happened was that the, it, it, it's a loss. And uh, I think this is the, uh, you know, the based uh, truly on the uh, sentiment or nationalistic feeling 
or whatever, uh, you know, the, or it, it's kind of the uh, Britain first policy. Nothing, nothing, no, nothing else. Uh, so it's uh, very much akin to the, uh, you know, the um, uh, US um, uh, uh, America first policy. What is the reason for it? What is the concept for, for that? There is no strategy. It seems to me, at least as from, uh, for Japanese, as one Japanese, you know, personally. <laughs> if that would happen with a great concept for the future, as uh, you rightly said, uh, Professor, the uh, president of the Sciences Po, then I think we try to understand the reason why. But uh, I think it was not the case. So in which direction uh, the policy uh, should go? Or in which direction you uh, suppose that the, uh, uh, in the government uh, must go? It's only, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, it should be dependent on the negotiations. If ne ne negotiations is not successful enough, then what comes? It's a chaos. Uh, the hard Brexit. The hard Brexit means that the, there is not, or oh, very little confidence on, on, on the United Kingdom, UK. Uh, taking a, an example of the, you know, the universities and so on. We have also a uh, pretty huge, uh, pretty, uh, you know, a fair amount of the uh, students in, in Britain. But can we uh, recommend students to, go, to, to come here uh, when the, uh, you know, the uh, negotiations is not successful enough? The, uh, the economy or the Japanese uh, you know, the, uh, companies uh, will also be perhaps not, not whole, but partly withdrawing from England and then shifting to the European continent. Uh, if that is the case, uh, I think uh, it will be perhaps uh, uh, not in the, everybody's interest. So which interest are you representing? The, are you representing the interest of the whole UK or whole Europeans? Or are you simply representing the uh, middle class or lower class you know, <laughs> the interest? Uh, the same is true with the uh, Americans. The, uh, I don't, it doesn't seem to me that the United States is re representing the uh, whole United States or liberal world uh, interest. It seems to me that he is representing the Pittsburgh interest. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We have some distinguished presidents from the US here who are shaking their heads and saying, no, I don't want to answer that question on behalf of the US. Michael, on behalf of the UK, why did Brexit? <laughs> <laughs> um, How did we I'm get gonna, here? I'm going to start my answer with reminding you about UCL and the Chosu Five. So the Chosu Five were five Japanese gentlemen who came to UCL in 1861 um, and got, uh, first of all, they were looked after by the professors at UCL and educated and eventually went back to Japan. Effectively, one of them became the prime minister, one became the director of finance, one became <laughs> minister for railways, one for ports and one for uh, other aspects of transport. Um, and that is an example of what, you know, what's good about internationalism uh, in universities. And, um, and it's very open, and it's very engaging, and it's very interactive, and it's very supportive, and it's very developmental. Now, somehow, in the debate about Brexit, uh, all of that got overturned, if you like, by a degree of populism. Um, and that populism was very much against the government's view, um, almost, um, uh, not through, almost, um, uh, you know, in response to a big push to, to, to stay in from our government at the time. And, um, uh, and that rise of populism has been seen around the world and, uh, and of course, has led to the events in the United States of America that you, that you also described. Uh, and part of that was all, also about, you know, um, we don't want experts. We've had enough of experts I think that was Mr. Goh, wasn't it? This mm -hmm. country has had enough of experts. Yeah. Try having your appendix taken out <laughs> by somebody who isn't an expert. You know? uh, so, uh, so I think we've got to pull that back. I think there's a responsibility on universities. Mm -hmm. I do think that we were part of the problem. We, we almost, by definition here in the UK, educate 45 to 50% of the population, and they get a leg up in life because they do well. Uh, after an education uh, in our universities, and the other 50% don't. And I don't think we've done enough thinking or enough interacting with that other 50%. So that when we 
uh, make the points that we make. You're right, it does look like it's middle-class England abreacting. Uh, I, I would go, of course, disagree with that. You know, ultimately, at the end of the day, this country needs to be internationally competitive and we want to have a successful economy and we want to be uh, a nation that provides prosperity uh, for its citizens. I don't think we can achieve that without a strong higher education sector and strong science and innovation. But we have to persuade everyone uh, of that case. Thank you. I'm going to ask my colleagues to hold on to the notion of populism and what it might mean beyond Britain for a moment. We've got another question over here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francisco Cantu, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. I think it was Albert Einstein who said, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. So, question is, uh, can you imagine a world, especially for, for Kurt and Frederick, can you imagine a world on which uh, Europe has a new partners, for instance, uh, Russia, for instance, other countries with great science, and forget about the past and look forward to, to the future. So can you imagine a world like this? If not Russia, uh, China, Japan, or whatever. You know. Good. Well, it, it's clear that, obviously, the activity in which we are active is an international activity. So every university in this room here must act at the international scene. So that means that, of course, we have to continue to interact with the UK. We have to continue to interact with the United States. And that brings us back to the first question. And we are confronted, as well in the UK as in the US, with the outcome of democratic processes. So it's certainly for me as a lawyer quite uncomfortable to criticize the outcome of specific democratic processes uh, and, and say, well, those who voted in favor of leaving, they're all stupid and they didn't get the lessons. Obviously, it doesn't work like that. So you have to respect, on the one hand, the outcome of the democratic process. But on the other hand, as Michael indicated, you have to wonder where has it gone wrong? And, 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 and the problem here is that, that you have people in government at that point in time saying, we have had enough of experts but if I look now at the papers that are produced for the Brexit negotiations, it's clear that the government is in huge need of experts. Otherwise, they wouldn't put papers like that on the table. So, so, so it's clear that we as universities, uh, Michael already alluded to it, we have to be more open, we have to be more transparent, we have to indicate what is our added value, not only economic, financial, but certainly societal, uh, environmental in all kinds of ways, what is our added value, and try to make clear to the public that what we do is not only in our interest as institutions, but is in the first place in the interest of society, of the planet. And so it's clear that we have to do that on a global scene. It's not a question of continental Europe uh, retrieving on itself and saying we are just looking uh, into our own institutions and the rest of the world, we isolate ourselves from that. No, that would be an absolute mistake, I would say. Just adding on to what uh, Kurt just said, of course, the, the perspective has to be a global one, by definition, uh, because science uh, is, is a global, uh, <laughs> global issue and a global concern. Um, and as far as my institution is concerned, we're we pride our, ourselves on having um, as many as 470 partner universities in the world. We send our students, our third year students, literally to all uh, countries of the world and, and we have close ties with uh, institutions throughout the planet. These being said, it so happens that you mentioned Russia as one possible candidate for closer partnerships, scientific partnerships with, with Europe in the future. We have to be aware of the fact that we can only cooperate with countries in which academic institutions uh, are governed by the same principles of ac academic freedom uh, as the ones we are fortunate to have in, 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 in our countries. And this being said, there are also concerns within the EU 
that not all countries now might have exactly the same views on exactly how far academic freedoms uh, do and should extend. But whenever you mention countries like, uh, like, such as Russia, or you know, it could be Turkey, it could be any number of countries uh, on the planet at present, of course, uh, it's, there are some of the, those countries that are placing themselves, in a sense, outside of the normal realm of cooperation by simply making it impossible for academic institutions to function with the level of freedom that is necessary in order to produce good science. Michael, some imagining? Well, I, I guess a very important point to make is that there is no other agency anywhere in the world that will fund research collabor collaboration across multiple borders. No other official government agency. Uh, and that's precisely what the EU does. And that has been so productive uh, to, in terms of scientific excellence. So one of the problems about forming new partnerships with other parts of the world is that you're automatically talking about bilateral or maybe trilateral, if you're lucky, uh, relationships. And I think we need to be better than that. So um, if we could come up with, um, if I could imagine a global funding agency to replace the EU uh, Framework 9 programme, I'd be up for that, of course. That would be absolutely wonderful. I've tried in the past to set up uh, a funding uh, scheme between the UK, the United States and China. It went quite a long way. It got up to ministerial level in all three uh, governments, or certainly senior official level in all three governments, um, and fell flat on its face eventually mainly because, of course, the national funding systems know that the money is going to be taken from them and given to the partnership working, uh, and they don't like that, so they obstruct. So, so there are huge problems about, about working as multi-national um, uh, uh, research partnerships, and the EU, to its credit, has cracked that and opened it up, actually. I mean, it's not limited to EU countries. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I think we'll miss hugely. Could we reproduce that on our own from the UK? Um, I don't think it's going to last for two seconds if we suggest to the British taxpayer that we should be funding everybody's research all the way around the world. So uh, I don't think it's something one nation can do on its own. It's got to be done by, by an agency like the EU. Very good. Other points, questions, particularly from other national perspectives. Andrew. Can you get the microphone over here? I just wanted to follow up more of a comment than a question, Kurt's point, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think we all have a tendency, and, and I'm as guilty as everyone else, to react in, in, in emotionally, but also very much uh, decrying Brexit, demonizing President Trump. Actually, these are the results of democratic processes, and we must work within those processes. If you demonize Trump, you demonize the 60 million people who voted for him. Uh, the question that came earlier, I must now also just respond. Uh, the comment that was made about Pittsburgh is a good example of that. Pittsburgh is a great city that I called home for a decade in my life. And on the day that Trump withdrew from the Paris Accord, uh, the statement he made said that in America we are governing for Pittsburgh, not for Paris. The following day, the mayors of Paris and Pittsburgh together wrote an article in the Washington Post supporting the climate accords, the Paris climate accords, and also Pittsburgh committed itself to continuing in those Paris accords. And so there we see an example of continuing the democratic processes as you see in cities around America, states around America, institutions around America who've responded in a, in a direct but also a democratic way to the things that they find concerning in the Trump administration. Thank you. Any other comments or points that people want to make at this point? Uh, yes, sir. Could we get a microphone here, please? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Neil Ward from the University of East Anglia, and uh, 
I'm here representing the Aurora Network, which is a network of nine European uh, research-intensive universities. Bre Brexit is obviously really depressing, um, but just before the referendum at UEA, we, uh, uh, with the Free University in Amsterdam, uh, started exploring setting up uh, multilateral partnerships with similar universities, similar size and similar ethos. And we now have nine partners in the network. Um, and I just wonder whether, um, looking at a sort of positive agenda post-Brexit, uh, there might be a sort of uh, accelerated impetus for British universities to move beyond bilateral um, to more multilateral networks where they can exchange um, researchers, um, also develop joint programmes between students and just deepen relationships in a new kind of model of um, international working. So I'd be interested in your comments on that. Kurt, something about Leru? Well, Leru has been launching, I think, four or five years ago, what we call the Global Council of Research Intensive University Networks. And, and the purpose there is that on an annual basis, we bring together 10 networks of research intensive universities from all over the planet. And in that framework, we try to uh, brainstorm on the one hand about all kinds of policy developments that we see worldwide in the research and education world. But at the same time, we also see this as an opportunity with the AAU in the States, the U15 in Canada, the U415 in, in Germany, uh, the, the group, the GO8 in Australia, the C9 in China. With those groups, we also try to see to what extent that we can bring the academics and the universities in those networks together to come up with a closer collaboration. Because at the end of the day, and this has been said a number of times already this morning, it's not about the amount of collaborations that you have as a university. We all know that. It's about the quality of those collaborations. And we think that bringing 10 networks of research-intensive universities together uh, from the different parts of the world and, and trying to collaborate as well policy-wise, uh, we have uh, applied and we got this recognition from the United Nations that we are part of or a recognized party in the Economic and Social Committee of the United Nations so that we can also have a say with this group of 10 networks and everything that is happening worldwide on research, innovation, education. Um, so policy-wise, but also on the academic working floor, how can we bring universities from different parts of the world together in the framework of this Global Council? And we created this Global Council of Research Intensive University Networks as a kind of uh, initiative to complement what the research funders have been doing over the past few years. You all know, of course, the Global Research Council, which is grouping something like the 50-plus biggest research funders worldwide. So it's clear, uh, we, of course, we also were aware of the fact that those research funders very often uh, also try to speak for universities. And it's not because they fund our people that they also uh, employ our people. So, so we wanted to have a balanced approach there of funders and universities. So, but I think it's clear that we have to develop also a kind of global initiative in order to make sure that policy-wise we all go in the same direction on issues which are common for all of us. Uh, and on the other hand, that we can also reinforce collaboration between the members of those networks. Any further comments, Michael? Excellent. I'm going to turn to my uh, another quick question. That will be the, the last one there. Well, let me uh, briefly discuss the very definition of globalization, because my experience in the last 50 years is telling me that globalization, at least from my point of view, well, I'm from Korea, I'm president of International University. Well, Asian students have become global during the last 50 years by going abroad, by going to the United States, by going to Europe. And then Asian students have become global by inviting European and American universities, branch campuses to Asia and going through the education there I think Asians have become quite global. But then, now, at our university, for example, we want to bring Americans and Europeans to our campus and let them global by letting them come to Asia. But there is a futile attempt. We are very limited in bringing European students to Asia. I'm sure that, that there are, but in terms of the number, or the percentage-wise, 
I think there is a lot more Asians going to Europe and America than the other way around. And just a few years ago, I was invited to the European Parliament to discuss the reindustrialization of Europe. And I, I sort of propose that the true change of Europe may be becoming global rather than reindustrialization within Europe. Because 2,000 years ago, Romans went abroad. 500 to 200 years ago, Europeans went abroad. And therefore, uh, and through this, Europeans have become global. I sort of propose, if I may, by sending European young people abroad, perhaps globalization can be realized. That's a very meditative point to end on. Frederick, would you like to think about that concept of import-export of young minds um, and move beyond just simply the changing Europe to maintaining research excellence? And then I'll ask for concluding remarks. I would say I'm in full agreement with what our friend from Korea has just, uh, has just said. It so happens that, uh, as I uh, briefly said earlier, uh, my university, Sciences Po, 15 years ago, decided to make, make it compulsory for all its students in that third year of college to spend a full year abroad uh, for 85% of those students. That means going to a foreign um, uh, academic institution abroad throughout the planet. And the remaining 15% do internships or, or such like outside of France. Um, and we have been consistent in, in maintaining this system in place, and it has proven incredibly, um, in, incredibly gratifying and useful in changing those young people's perspective on their own life and on the world. Um, and we have resisted all attempts um, at you know, pushing us in the direction of creating Sciences Po campuses abroad, uh, and in a sense, exporting our, our system to, to uh, other countries and felt that the true worth of um, international cooperation lay in, the, in absorbing in the international experience what other institutions are able and, and willing to, to, to give us or to give our students. Um, so I could be more convinced of, of what you just said, in a sense. Thank you. Michael, some last thoughts? I uh, couldn't agree more. Very, very important. Key, a key performance indicator for us is to increase the number of... Uh, students who go and study abroad for a significant period of time. We haven't been bold enough to say everybody should. We're a huge organisation. We have a lot of children, a uh, lot of uh, students uh, who they come are from... They are <laughs> children. <laughs> the children, yeah. Freudian slip. Uh, we have a lot of students who come from low-income families. So actually putting the financial wherewithal to give people a, a year abroad um, is a bit of a barrier. But the importance of it is, is very clear. We have another disadvantage, and our disadvantage is that we speak English as a first language, which means that we're very lazy about learning other languages. So language is another barrier. Um, so we're also trying to address that by making sure that everybody at UCL has another language, either before they come to us or during their time with us, something that the British government has let slip in our schooling system, very sadly. Okay, on, on this last point, it's clear that we have to do everything uh, to, to stimulate brain circulation, as well at the level of students, at the level of staff, and this throughout the career for all groups which are uh, active in our institutions. Um, so brain circulation is an absolute must, and we have to avoid, of course, uh, all kinds of obstacles which are introduced by countries to, to block or to avoid or to make it problematic that this brain circulation is taking place. And that brings us back again to Brexit, of course. Uh, so I would end the session with calling upon all of you uh, to help us in Brussels, in London, to speak up loud and clear and to indicate to the political forces uh, that this brain circulation is absolutely key for the future welfare of our societies on both sides of the channel. Well, I feel we should be saying merci 
Gracias. Grazie, si sure. Um, any way you want to say thank you to our three panelists, Professor Michael Arthur, Kurt Deketela, and Frédéric Mion. Thank you very much. Thank you.